All right, picture this. It's the 1970s, an era of exploration, transformation, and awakening. The world's teetering on the edge of a psychedelic revolution, and two young brothers, Dennis and Terrence McKenna, decide to take a trip to the Colombian Amazon to meet with the Watoto people. Little did they know that that trip would change not only their lives, but the lives of so many of us who now could not imagine our lives without magic mushrooms. Tonight, we have the distinct honor of welcoming one half of this visionary brotherhood, the incredible Dennis McKenna. But our journey doesn't start in the limelight. It begins with humble origins. We're going to unravel the untold chapters of Dennis McKenna's early life and the bond he shared with his brother, Terrence. These two brothers embarked on an incredible quest to explore the realms of consciousness. And in doing so, they stumbled upon an incredible secret hidden in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. It was here that they encountered the mystical fungi that would change the course of their lives and the lives of countless others. Together, they brought the art of magic mushroom cultivation to the masses, igniting a cultural and scientific revolution that continues to resonate with us today. So fasten your seatbelts as we travel back in time, explore the mind-expanding journeys of the McKenna brothers, and dive deep into the secrets of mushroom cultivation that have shaped our understanding of consciousness and the world of fungi. This episode is a unique blend of history, science, and magic. So join us on this captivating mycological odyssey with the one and only Dennis McKenna. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and tonight, it's a big one for me. It's a big one for you guys. We're all going to get to sit down with Dennis McKenna. How cool is that? Um, first I, I, I got a shout out, you know, I'm going to talk to a legend. I'm going to have to wear some legendary gear, right? So, um, my buddy Kyle Cannon hooked it up. We got the Ohio mushroom DNA lab hat and shirt. Oh yeah. Check that shirt out. You guys want to get, get some of that cool gear, you know, give Kyle a shout out anyway. Thanks brother. Um, so tonight. I mean, what can I say? I've been grinding, guys. I've been trying to do this uh, right for a long time. Uh, you know, some bumps in the road. Um, had had just some really special talks with a lot of amazing people over the last year or so here. And uh, to tonight is special. I mean, this is this guy. This is the guy. He is the original us. He is the original cube grower growing in his basement has he's he had the tubs in his closet right he this this is the guy i can't be more excited to talk to him but first i uh, gotta shout out all uh patreon here patreon.com backslash michael geeky please consider supporting the show um yeah man the, the support means everything um it, it keeps me going it, it gives me a chance to do more things in the coming year i really want to get out more connect with more of you guys i want to go to tell you right i want to go to myco fest i want to go to nama i want to go to all the cool stuff it costs money i don't have a lot of it if you guys support me i'll get to more of these things um gonna be working on some additional content this winter um, you know, Geeky's not going to be out and about so much. So hopefully going to grind it out in, in the lab here and uh, do some cool stuff, you know, like the mutant grow along that we're going to get going here in about a month, um, as well as, uh, you know, growing zaps, preparing for the spring when we're going to do a bunch of outdoor grows together, hopefully uh, connect with some outdoor growers in the area. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. But anyway, uh, yeah, please consider supporting uh, the show. If you can't support on Patreon, um, you know, when I uh, when this airs, when it premieres, um, you can do super stickers. You can do stuff like that. It's kind of fun and it, it adds to the hype a little bit. And then, of course, you can go to my Etsy and just buy stuff from me. Um, buy a shirt, buy a hat. They're cool. They're affordable, right? 
And uh, if you already got one, then consider buying uh, a cool hat from Kyle. Um, anyway, also want to shout out my uh, my mods on Discord. You guys are kicking butt and taking names, although there's not a lot of names to take because we got a great Discord. It's chill. People just talk about growing mushrooms. We stay focused. It's wonderful. No drama. Low drama. That's what I'm all about. I'm too old for drama, guys. All right, next week we're going to be talking to Ray. We're going to check in with her. She's, you know, riding her little bike uh, down to the tip of Texas. We're going to find out how that's going, and uh, we're going to sit down with Fungi Florist. That should also be very cool. He's uh, he's doing some really cool stuff, kind of in the vein of uh, Professor Bo Fun, you know, Bonsai Fungi, um, just doing cool, more artistic things with uh, mushroom growth, so that should also be fun. But, you know, every day... All we do, grow mushrooms, and uh, let's go ahead and just talk to the guy who got it all going for us. Um, so before we do that, let me just give you kind of a lowdown. Uh, you know, we've all listened to Terrence, uh, you know, tapes probably for hours and hours on end on repeat uh, while working in the lab. Um, and a lot of us know who Dennis is, but I don't, man, you know, I knew, thought I knew who he was, but... Uh, he's accomplished a lot. He's done a lot of things. So let me just run through his bio a little bit so you guys can, can really appreciate who we're going to get to know here and, and all the stories we're going to hear from him. So he's born in 1950 in Paonia, Colorado. He gets his BA in biology from the University of Colorado in 1973. In 1976, him and his brother, they uh, after getting back from their trip to Columbia, they, they wrote this book right here. Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide, uh, you know, they use pseudonyms, of course, back then, everybody's paranoid. After that, he got his MA in Botany from the University of Hawaii in 1979 and a PhD in Botanical Sciences from the University of British Columbia in 1984. So I think he was like 34 at the time. Born in 1950, yeah, 34. Uh, Dennis received postdoctoral research fellowships in the Laboratory of Clinical Pharmacology at the National Institute of Mental Health and in the Department of Neurology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He joined Shaman Pharmaceuticals as director of ethnopharmacology in 1990 and relocated to Minnesota in 1993 to join the Avita Corporation as senior research pharmacologist. Uh, in 2001, he joined the faculty of the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. He was a key organizer and participant in the Hawaska Project, an international biomedical study of ayahuasca used by indigenous people and uh, syncretic religions religious groups in Brazil. He's also a founding board member of the Hafter Research Institute and serves on the advisory board of nonprofit organizations in the field of ethnobotany and botanical medicines. At Hafter, he continued his focus on the therapeutic uses of psychoactive medicines derived from nature and used in indigenous ethnomedical practices. Dennis is the author or co-author of over 40 scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals. His publications have appeared in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology, European Journal of Pharmacology, Brain Research, Journal of Neuroscience, Journal of Neurochemistry, all the journals, uh, Economic Botany, Alternative and Complementary Therapies, and a bunch of other places. All right, notes gone. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm just sitting in my basement talking to you guys. It's something. But this guy, this is a special guy. So, all right, let, let's let's go ahead and get let's get to know him. Let's get talking to him. So, without further ado, Dennis McKenna. All right, welcome to the show, Dennis McKenna. How you doing? Very good. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I, the pleasure is absolutely all mine. Um, I, I'm very excited to, to hear some stories and, and learn a few things and get your perspective on, on a lot of what's going on these days. Um, so, so I received, uh, through our kind friend, Jeff Bezos, uh, this book not too long ago, the uh, brotherhood of the screaming abyss, my life with Terrence McKenna. Um, great. I, I got the new one, the, the new updated, uh, 2023. And, uh, Great. Thank for, you for that. First off, I got to say this. I mean, I don't think it can be overstated how you lucked out having this photo. Because from what I know about you and your brother, that is quite a metaphoric photo. Indeed it is. Yes, it's a, it is a lucky break. Man. That is a, a photo that my mother took of us 
1957, she had a little brownie instant instant thing. Okay. Well, it did. It was a film camera, but we used to go to the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, which was about uh, 30 miles from our home, and it was a favorite haunt. And that is the original Screaming Abyss. It go. is. It's an amazing place. If you ever get to Western Colorado, go see Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. It is the deepest natural gorge in the Midwest. It's about 3,000 feet deep oh. and, and places. And at that time, we used to go over there. My family would go over and we'd take a picnic, you know, and just basically tour it. And, uh, and on the way, we used to cross this arid part, which we called the Dobies, the Adobes, between Paonia and Crawford. Colorado, which was where this place was near to. And uh, in the Dobies, we used to take trips and go look for shark's teeth because that whole area used to be an inland sea. So you could take a sifter and you could go through the, the you know, you could sort through the soil in the Dobies. You could come up with, you know, these shark's teeth. There were millions of them in, wow. in the soil. So that was a favorite pastime, and that's what got Terrence and me, but first Terrence, I mean, Terrence being four years older, he led the charge in, in a lot of ways as we were growing up geeky. and But he got interested in fossils, really, because of those search for shark's teeth. Uh -huh. But the, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison was really impressive at the time. I remember my mother telling me a story she was saying I was a babe in arms at the time you know I did I wasn't even walking I must have been about two or something but I was beginning to speak and uh, you know we were standing at the edge of the of the canyon you know at the railing at the lookout and I looked at it and I said big hole <laughs> wow. which it certainly was and is wow. you know and it's very interesting to go back there i was just there this summer every time i go to paonia which is maybe once a year if i'm lucky i always make a point to go over there because it is it is the screaming abyss you know for lots of people and and that was the genesis of that picture Wow. So I didn't think you were going to take me off on such a wonderful tangent right off the bat. Uh, but that <laughs> tangents that, are yes. me. That's what yes. I do. <laughs> okay. That's fascinating because that really says to me now, I grew up in Western Michigan. We lived right on the dunes of uh, Lake Michigan, right by a state park. So my environment really informed who I became as well. And so I'm just sitting there thinking about you and Terrence going on these cool trips in Colorado, getting to see like, I can't even imagine being that young and seeing right, a, a, an abyss, a, a, a literal frightening abyss at, at that age. And that, I think that's yeah. great that, that your parents took you out and you got to see some of those things and how it must have informed. Yeah, this uh, is this is what we love to do. You know, there were so many things in Western Colorado that were, you know, an easy less than a day's trip. I mean, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison was maybe, you know, 30 minutes away from yeah. our hometown. So we could go over there all the time. And that's great. And did. So, so your, your, your parents took you out, you, you, you got to do cool things in Colorado and, and let, let's kind of start out young adults, you and Terrence, you're, you're, you're 21. Now I'm going to tell you right now, most of the people watching here, um, especially a lot of the old school ones who've been growing mushrooms for a while. They know all about this book. This is a new version. Um, uh, yeah. I had the old version mm -hmm. at one point in time, but I, I lost it. And so now I got the new shiny version. Um, this is the first book, right? This is the first book on, on cultivating mushrooms. But what precipitated that is this trip that you guys took down to Columbia in the, the right. Amazon. Uh, right. Here's what I want to know. So how do you too at such a young age because i just went to mexico and my wife i'm, I'm mid 40s right she's like are you sure you want to go to mexico is it safe down there let's like you know <laughs> let, let's be cautious 
And I'm yeah. like, no, I, I, I think it's okay. It's a good state. It's the, the nicer part of Mexico, minimal cartel presence. But you guys are very young, and you decide to go to just the depths of the Amazon. How did that happen? How, who came up with the idea? Um, what hurdles did you have to get through? Did you tell your parents? Were they upset? All those interesting, like, get us, get us to Colombia. Well, it's kind of a long story, but uh, but uh, I mean, a point that needs to be made is it, we didn't think of Colombia as a place, dangerous place, particularly. It wasn't as dangerous as it has been, you know, in recent past. There was no concern about the cocaine trade and, uh -huh. and the dangers of that and so on. There was so we weren't concerned about that and, and we were you know, the danger was just having to do with going to the Amazon, which we were completely, uh, you know, new to to being in the Amazon, although Terence had traveled in Indonesia for two years approximately before we met up to go to, to, go to La Chirera. So he had experience with jungle travel. He was he was hiding out from Interpol at that time. This was 68, about 69 to 71 or so. Uh, you know, he was he was an international criminal fugitive for smuggling hashish. Okay. So he was hanging, hiding in Indonesia and he was actually hunting butterflies, you know, which oh. is how he made a living there. Uh, right. the, the hashish trade had collapsed and he was on the run. That's all recounted in the yeah. book. Every all our secrets and scandals and everything, pretty much, with a few major exceptions, which I didn't write about. We can get into that. But the major one, that that anyway, he was on the lam, but we met up in Victoria, British Columbia in nineteen seventy, about two weeks before my mother died. She was dying of cancer back in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we had been talking for years about going to the Amazon, and we were seeking a very obscure Amazonian hallucinogen. We were we were obsessed with DMT. That was the thing. It was DMT was the catalyst. We were obsessed with DMT. We'd encountered it in Berkeley. My brother was very good at working the matrix. It was quite rare then, but he mm. found it we both were completely astonished by it and thought this this is more than just a psychedelic this is some kind of portal you know to another dimension this is god knows what this is <clears throat> you know and we but the the issue with dmt at the time for us and for other people too is that it's so darn short you know it only lasts 20 minutes Right. So by the time you get to the place and get to see what's happening, you're already coming down. And so we wanted something that was more prolonged so that we could actually explore that dimension, you know, which we really did think of as another dimension, not so much of the mind, but another place. And we thought, and we heard, we thought if we had an orally active form of DMT, it would last longer and we could spend more time in that space. And that was true. We didn't know about ayahuasca at that time. It was not understood that ayahuasca is exactly that. It's an orally active form of DMT. You know, DMT from the admixture plants are potentiated by the beta carbolines in the Banisteriopsis, the vine, and that stretches out the pharmacokinetics from 30 minutes to six hours or so. So, but we heard about another orally active tryptamine based hallucinogen psychedelic, which was called Ukuhe. Mm -hmm. And that was published uh, uh, by Schultes. He reported it. Uh, and it was derived from Varola species. Varola is a species of trees in the nutmeg family. Uh, from which the sap is extracted to make snuffs. And in many parts of the Amazon, Varola snuffs are used and they're, they're active because you snuff them, you know, so, so DMT is 
inactivated when you take it orally by itself, but with the MAO inhibitors in Banseriopsis, it's protected from degradation and it becomes orally active. So this was another orally active DMT based preparation. And, uh, uh, you know, and Schultes had written about this and he'd actually published a paper in the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets called Varola as an orally active hallucinogen. And when we stumbled on this paper, Terry and I thought, this is it. This is the secret. We have to go after this thing. And, uh, and, the reason, and that's what led us to La Chirera because La Chirera in Southern Colombia was the ancestral home of the Witoto people. And they were the tribes. There was a couple other groups, but mainly the Witoto that used this thing, this, this thing called Ukuhe. We thought Ukuhe is the secret. We got to go looking for Ukuhe, right? So we, I quit school. Terrence never had a job. He was, he was still on the lab, but he flew over the States so they couldn't nab him. And we met up in Bogota and we went down river and down the Putumayo river and up the Rio Igarapara. And eventually we ended up at La Chirera. And when we got to La Chirera, I mean, this, this story can be short or long, but I'll, I'll, I'll truncate it a little bit. After many adventures, we got to La Chirera and uh, we'd been warned by an anthropologist who had, we'd encountered on the way in, who was studying the Witoto people. And he basically said, you can't just march in here and t start talking about Ukuhe you know, they're going to go completely nuts. And, and he went nuts when we showed up, but that's a whole other story. You know, we, right. I mean, we were, we were in full countercultural hippie regalia, you know, at that time, this was 1971. So bells, beads, beards, you know, two or three exotic pets, a couple monkeys and parrots, and, you know, we were a colorful band. We were far more colorful than the Witoto, but, we said, okay, doc, no worries. We'll be very discreet, you know, actually having no intention to be discreet. Right. We finally got to La Chirera and we thought, okay, let's get settled in and then we'll start making inquiries about Ukuhe. But our plans were hijacked in some ways because the mission village, La Chirera, had been they cleared the forest around it, about 200 acres, and they were, they'd populated it with Cebu cows. And uh, the dung of the Cebu cow happens to be, the cattle happens to be the preserved substrate for Psilocybe cubensis. Yep. And we arrived there at the height of the rainy season, and there was basically out of every cow pie, which were many, were big, beautiful clusters of Psilocybe cubensis. And we thought, oh, well, this is an unexpected gift. You know, great. You know, while we're waiting for the real secret, waiting for this Ukuhe to show up uh, or find it or find somebody that knew about it, we thought, oh, you know, we knew what these were. We had absolutely no experience with them, but we knew from our homework that the what these mushrooms were. And we thought, well, this will be just uh, this will be a nice distraction. This will be a pleasurable thing to do while we're looking for ukuhe. Well, so we started eating the mushrooms uh, quite regularly. Actually, we effectively incorporated them into our diet because there wasn't a whole lot to eat otherwise, other than the rice and canned beans and stuff like that. We'd brought with it fruit you could buy from the local people and so on. But we had a very spare diet, and but the mushrooms were there. And we started eating these things. And we started eating them regularly and rather uh, rather high doses. And uh, they quickly rearranged our priorities, shall we say. <laughs> uh, you know, our original quest for Ukuhe kind of got shelved to the back burner. And, and the mushrooms emerged as 
this is the real secret. You know, we it quickly made clear it was the real secret and it had lots to tell us, you know, and in the way that mushrooms do, we sort of entered into a prolonged dialogue with the mushroom, a download of information that lasted over a number of days, a num uh, you know, stretching on into uh, a couple of weeks when it was effectively telepathically transmitting all kinds of information about what we could do, a kind of psych psychic surgery in a sense, uh, an experiment that we could perform. We thought of it as an experiment. In no way was it was it a real scientific experiment? Right. It should be called, you know, the ritual or the, you know, something like that at Lachera because there were no control. It was no, not really scientific, but it was based on this sound that we could hear at high doses yeah. of mushrooms. And it found, turned out that when you imitated this sound, which you could do, if you listen closely, you could imitate the sound and then very interesting energetic things began to go on, you know, in our bodies and it downloaded this whole, you know, I guess protocol or notion that if we, if we made this sound and, and directed it toward mushroom, it would set up a resonance with the tryptamines in our brain create a standing waveform and uh, essentially create, enable us to create a hyperdimensional object that was both mind and matter that was made of us and the DNA of our own DNA and the DNA of the mushroom. It would be a standing waveform that would read out the information in the base pairs of the DNA, which we equated to the Akashic records. That's the short version. <laughs> yeah, so you're just doing the normal things 21 year olds are doing these days. Yeah, that right. Is, Being yeah. completely reckless and totally clueless. Yeah, exactly. That, but that's no, exactly sophistic what we sophisticated <laughs> recklessness. Yes. But we managed to turn this into careers. You know, we yes. wrote books about it. Most of the information that was transmitted to us in this these this prolonged altered state you know subsequently and especially from the perspective of now like you know i'm 73 right so 53 years later i understand that most of this was bunk you know i mean there were a few flashes of insight but not at the time you know i mean we were we were totally in thrall to this telepathic entity, which we understood to be either the mushrooms or the mushrooms were a channel for an extraterrestrial intelligence that was, or an extra dimensional or extra somewhere intelligence that was transmitting uh, this gnosis to us. And, and basically the blueprints for how you turn your body into a UFO you know, or a trans-dimensional vehicle that is both a space-time machine and a conscious entity constructed yeah. out of your own DNA and your own nervous system. And uh, you know, we had various expectations about what the results of that experiment were going to look like, what the outcome was supposed to look like. None of that happened because it couldn't happen. It would have violated every law, every sure. known law of physics yeah. and collapsed the space-time continuum in, in, in the process. Space-time continuum proved to be quite resilient. Uh, we, not so much. And in right. fact, uh, you know, we both underwent prolonged what some people would say would, was a psychosis and it certainly had elements of that it had elements of alien abduction experiences uh very much all those all those elements where it had elements of shamanic initiation and i've actually done a a talk uh about the experiment at la Chirera, which was 
uh, with, with exactly that title. It was called The Experiment at La Chirera, uh, Psychotic, Psychotic Breakdown, Alien Abduction, or, uh, or Shamanic Initiation, or Alien Abduction. And that talk is available. It's out there on the internet somewhere. And, uh, and the conclusion of the, the, the sort of the, 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 the theme of the talk that it was actually all three, you know, in a certain sense, it certainly was a psychotic break, which uh, primarily happened to me, but we both underwent prolonged and complementary uh, psychotic uh well, it, psychotic is such a such a nasty word. It, it is. Shall it's we a heavy say word. altered states? Yes. We understood each other completely. Terence and I. We were in telepathic communication. Our companions were not, and our companions were quite appalled at what was going on. And their agenda being, these people are three sheets to the wind. They need to be airlifted out of here as quickly as possible. Uh -huh gotten to a psychiatric facility, but uh, fortunately we were in the middle of the Amazon, so we couldn't do that. Right. You couldn't just call up, you know, 911 and that will take you away. So that's good because it, it gave this, we were able to let this whole experiment or this whole process play out. And eventually we did recover. You know, it took three or four weeks of, to really get our feet sort of back on the ground. And, and I think some people would say we never really quite achieved that, you know, because we came back from the experiment with, with, uh, and the, and the trip with a whole lot of funny ideas, you know, uh, some of which became the crystal, the, the kernel of the Terence's time wave theory. And some of my, uh, speculations about uh drug action and a, a theoretical uh model of drug action having to do with the binding of these compounds into neural dna uh which sounds crazy knowing what we know now about how these drugs work none of this is true but at the time there was even a theory out there that was being taken half seriously by some neuroscientists that that the receptors for the psychedelics were actually frag you know links of neural dna in the neurons mm. this was the state of the knowledge at that time now of course we know exactly what the receptors are we've you know they've been isolated and cloned and and you know tertiary secondary structures have all been determined and you know it's all been pretty well worked out it has nothing to do with our totally bonkers theory about how these things work. Yeah. But, you know, it was it was fun while it lasted, shall we say. So that's yes. that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, no pun intended, uh, uh, summary of our experiment at La Chirera and so why why we ended up down there at 20 years old. In my case, I was 20. My brother was 24. Right. And that's what led us down there and led us off the rails for a while. So, so I got a question. So let's say Dennis was the older brother and Terrence was the younger brother. Do you still end up down there? Well, I'm the younger brother. No, I'm sorry. That, uh, maybe I said that wrong. So you're the older brother. Let's, yeah. let's imagine you're the older brother. Okay. Do, you, do you still, and, and then he's sort of following your lead. Was this really on your radar as well? Like, would you still end up down there or, or was he just hell bent on getting down there? And you said, yeah, let's go. Let's see. What no, it was do. pretty much. Well, we were both hell bent on getting down there. Cool. You know, we were, we were both with the program to get down there. But when we actually got down there, I was the one that was getting the download. So then I, sort of became the one leading the charge. Gotcha. You know, all of these ideas were pouring in on me. And the idea was that, you know, of this experiment that, that, uh, that we could, that we could attempt, this was pretty much what I was being told by the entities or whatever it was that was, you know, that we imagined was directing the show. I was the one that devised 
the experiment that had to do with making this sound that we could hear and imitating it. Pretty much, I guess I can take the credit for, for that or the blame as you well. No, you I would. I it. think you should take the credit for that. Um, well, so okay. it, it really, to me, I mean, I love this. I, I interview so many people and we talk about important, significant trips that they've had. And it is so fascinating how it, the set every time, right? You came in with a set, you said, we're doing this experiment and, and, and it was a sophisticated, creative, higher level thought process. And so from that, so many huge ideas. Who cares if, if science 50 years later proved that that wasn't accurate or not? I mean, I love a scientist that comes up with a hypothesis and then moves forward to try to test it out. That's amazing. I, I think that's very cool and really a testament to you two that uh, you just, you went down there, right? We got so easy now. I can grow, I'm in my basement right now. I can grow beautiful, amazing, unlimited amounts of mushrooms for very low cost. I did not have to go to the Amazon, so... Right. That's, that's uh, right. you know, a different world, a different time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what you say about science is, is true. You know, this is one of the beauties of science is you can build a hypothesis and then you test it, you know, you test it against reality. Yeah. And we did that. We built the, we built a hypothesis about what was going on and we tested it and you know, in the in the immediate instance, it failed in the sense that our predicted outcomes did not happen. But over the long term, you know, I mean, I guess particularly Terence we was 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 reluctant to abandon it, and uh, effectively made a career out of it. I mean, the, the, the kernel of the probably one of the most interesting ideas that came out of the experiment was this idea of the time wave, mm -hmm. which didn't appear fully formed at La Chirera. It took years of thinking about this and constructing this mathematical model of time based on the I Ching, you know, and it was called time wave zero and it in some ways it was a very beautiful thing it was a beautiful mathematical construction and it 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 undeniably it was at at the very least it was a a calendar that worked mm -hmm. based on the I Ching. if terence had let it go at that and published his findings in the journal of you know, sinology or something, uh, it probably would have been accepted and his colleagues would have would have said, well, this is really interesting way of looking at, at the I Ching. And then he and it would have been totally forgotten. But no, he wasn't content to do that. He, he insisted that this was actually a model of time and that time had a structure and the, the energy uh states described by the time wave was a description of the ingression of novelty this concept of novelty into the space-time continuum that was it that 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 you know i mean the simplest premise is yes there is something new under the sun and in fact every day something occurs that never before occurred in the history of the universe that's novelty but there's no way to predict novelty uh but the the time wave was an, uh, an attempt to do that to actually quantify this concept called novelty and uh, and not only that but that but the premise was that time was a fractal it was a fractal spiral it had a beginning and an end and at the end, the density of novelty would be so great that you would effectively, it would, you can call it like a, like a temporal black hole. You could call it a mm. temporal singularity where the density of novelty rose to the level that uh, everything came together effectively 
and uh and 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 time collapse or or time as we understand it and space time because you can't really separate these things you know space and time would achieve some new metastable state that would be atemporal that would effectively be this is what happens after time ends right and that that term is an oxymoron because the term after implies right. temporality but when when time ends when this when this uh, singular this temporal singularity opens up then well then just like a physical black hole a physical singularity you cannot say what's going on on the other side of that event horizon in a yeah. black hole and the interesting and and the same thing is true of this theory about about the the the, the temporal singularity what's interesting about that is if you it means that literally anything could be going on on the other side of this thing anything and uh, of course it was all gibberish you know it was all bullshit it, it wasn't intentionally bullshit but the, the time wave theory had major flaws you know major assumptions and and this this comes back it's... to the uh the 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 testing of a hypothesis the yes. problem with the time wave is it cannot be disproven you know and if and therefore it cannot be proven i mean in other words terence was never able to define what would disprove it and that's yeah. essential when you construct hypotheses you have to say well the hypothesis is, is based on you know x y and z and, and a number of premises and if it doesn't meet those premises then you either have to dismantle you have to reject it or you have to modify it you know yeah. and uh, he was never able to define uh in any coherent way what would what would disprove the time the time wave and and nor and the only thing that would prove it was this postulated endpoint which shifted around many times as he worked with it over the years finally settling on december 21st 2012 you know which is related to the mayan calendar right. and all that but other things as well this is when the singularity is going to come together so the whole the, the premise of the theory was based on this one postulate and 2012 came and went nothing happened you know and and so the theory was disproven you know right and terence didn't of course he was he'd been gone for 12 years so he never lived to to see that his theory was disproven and maybe that's great yeah potentially yeah. yes I, merciful in a way exactly i think i still i mean here's here's my whole thing how many things does science have to get wrong before it gets something right right i think many it's as important things. to get that's... things wrong that's a part of it that's great and i mean i truly think you two as brothers it's just you guys are just these especially for people who are into enjoying altered states of consciousness who want to use that to deepen their understanding of their world of their life and meaning and all that stuff you two are like the yin and yang brothers you guys so perfectly complement each other and are pulling right. each other i mean it's it's just reading about uh, you know reading about you two is just wonderful and of course, all the all the sibling stuff is there too, which is also fun and entertaining. But I mean, it's really beautiful, and I can hear. Yes, the reverence. Good, good place for to that. plug the new edition. You, folks can order it from the Synergetic Press. Oh, uh, I mean, it's right, online, and and it's the new edition, and there's with, fifty pages of new yes. material in there. Yes, but what I what I want to say. Uh, you know, in response to that is, you know, 
all this metaphysical stuff, you know, and pseudoscientific theory building and predictions and of what was going to happen and all that, you know, none of that happened. What did happen, and maybe in some ways is a validation of, of why we went there, what did happen did not require the violation of any physical laws at all. What happened that over the course of between now and then, it's been, you know, 50, 50 some years since we went to La Chirera, what happened was something very simple. We brought the spores back with us. Yeah. We mucked around with them. We figured out how to grow them. We made that technology available to the world in a very simple, you know, little pamphlet, basically, the Magic Mushroom Growers Guide. And we did that because we wanted people to have access to the mushrooms. And what we were really looking for was validation of our experiences, you know, right. so we wanted people to be able to grow the mushrooms and have these experiences and confirm that we were on to something or that we were totally nuts. And as it turns out, we were on to something. A lot of people have had yes. these experiences and, and it's made mushrooms have become, you know, the, the kind of the central psychedelic that's, that's triggered our emergence into what you may not now call the, the psych, the age of psychedelics, you know, or the yeah. psychedelic Renaissance as it's called, uh, I like that. It age. didn't happen overnight. There were a lot of people yes. with their basements, their closets, and so on, full of mushrooms, growing them, eating them, sharing them with friends, and this has changed global consciousness. And I'm not one hundred. I am not uh, taking credit for any of this. We were working for, you know, it wasn't us. It was the mushrooms. <laughs> the mushrooms were were running the show in a sense. As all plants do. Well, yes. mushrooms aren't plants, but, you know, I think the mushrooms were, uh, you know, they work in their relationship with the human species. They form symbiosis, you know, and uh, the mushrooms, mushrooms agenda is very simple. They just want to grow and spread and they'll do yeah. that any way they can, you know. And if they can form a symbiosis with a curious monkey who wants to propagate them and grow them and spread them as we've done, then why not? This is, this is a, everybody benefits. The mushroom gets to grow and we get these experiences and, uh, and it really, um, it helps us be better people. You know, it I, does. I really think that the mushrooms help people become more human in a way. Yeah. All right, so here's what I want to know, because we, everybody watching the show, I mean, we just are extremely hardcore. We're like those orchid people, right, that are just obsessed with orchids on a level that you just can't even understand. That's right. definitely us. And that's all thanks to you two bringing this stuff over here. I have people who tell me, you know, they still got this book, a pamphlet, whether they got it from their uncle, they got it from the Internet, wherever they got it. And it helped them yep. start growing mushrooms. So it's now, still out there. It's still. For yes. Sale. You, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's what I want to know. So you say we figured out how to grow them. How did you, did you just use basic understanding of fungal science? And like, I, tell me a little bit, a little bit of the stories of how you stumbled through figuring out the text to grow these things. Well, uh, it was, it was a bit of trial and error and a couple of, uh, lucky accidents, you know, we were mucking around. We didn't really know anything about mushroom cultivation. We were able to put the spores on Petri plates and we could get the mycelium and, and mm -hmm. then where do you go from there? But back in, uh, so we came back with the spores in 71 and we kind of played around with it. For, and they, we're not the only ones that were trying to do this, obviously, at that time. But we, we were playing around with it, trying to figure out a way to grow these things. And uh, as it happened, I 
uh, I, I had access. I was I, I graduated from Colorado University, but I'd gone back to Colorado State University uh, after my graduation. I went back in 1974 to get some additional courses that I needed. And the reason I went there was because I'd been on a pilgrimage to see Schultes at yeah. Harvard. And I wanted to work with him. I wanted to be his graduate student. And I saw him and he was very kind. He said, what you need to do is get more chemistry and more taxonomy. Go there, take some more courses and apply, you know, and I'll sort of, I'll look for your application. So I got myself back. I came back to California after that trip, and I went back to Colorado, to Colorado State. And as it happens, this is one of those strange coincidences that isn't really a coincidence, you know? As it happens, my best friend from, from high school, who was a very gifted horticulturalist, he was in charge of the botany greenhouse at Colorado State University. He was running the greenhouse. They had a tissue culture lab there. They had all the equipment we needed to do this work. And I had access to it. He said, sure, you want to come in, putter around, use the autoclaves, whatever, I don't care. That's fine. Well, it was a little better than that. Actually, he was in on the conspiracy. But and we we were virtually roommates. We were living down the hall from each other in this, you know, scuzzy student, you know, uh, apartment building. So we were we were spending a lot of time. I'm still in close touch with this gentleman, and uh, and so he said, "Sure, you have access to the thing. You can grow these cultures, and we'll you know we'll see what you can do." And uh, about that time there was a paper published in Mycologia by a, a uh, scientist from the USDA. And it was something about uh, growing agaricus by sporus uh, uh, on substrates of sterilized grain in mason jars, you know, mm. and, and he had published this paper and it was basically uh, directed toward people that wanted to study the genetics of the common edible mushroom. It was an easy way to grow a few mushrooms, basically. And we stumbled on this paper and we decided, well, let's give this a try. Maybe this will work. Lo and behold, it did work. You know, it worked rather spectacularly. And, you know, we had these jars, uh, you know, incubating in, in the lab at Colorado State and then eventually incubating in my closet, in my <laughs> in my apartment, pretty much. And before we knew it, we had mushrooms coming out of our ears, almost literally. We had more mushrooms than we knew what to do with. A classic and problem, yes. That, yeah, this was a nice problem to have. And uh, so... Uh, this was the breakthrough and uh, Terence came out. Well, I shared the knowledge with Terence, of course. I just said, this is what you do. It's, it's dead easy. You can do this, you know, and he tried it and succeeded. And, uh, and then, you know, about that time, uh, I finished my, uh, my uh, courses at, at Colorado State and uh, I was growing mushrooms and, you know, in my apartment. And then I moved up to uh, Big Thompson Canyon outside of Loveland, where I could uh, rent a house. And I, I set up a bigger operation there and was, was still in the jar, still using the same method. But I set up an operation there. And then, uh, and then I moved back to... Uh, well, I was I had applied for graduate school at the University of Hawaii, and I got accepted there. And so I uh, was I was able to move from from Colorado from Fort Collins back to Berkeley, and then and that by that time Terence had a whole house full of mushrooms. He rented a big house on. College Avenue in Oakland, and we were actually, he was actually pumping out, 
Oh yeah. And initially, I mean, yeah, we were. It was all totally illegal. Uh, we didn't really care. <laughs> right. We were. We were. Uh, we were growing mushrooms in these jars, and initially, we were actually growing the. We produced the jars, and put them in these styrofoam containers, little terrariums essentially. And then we would sell sets of jars before they fruited. And then all people had to do was spray them, keep them moist, and the mushrooms would come. And then after Love a while, it. we began to think, well, this is ridiculous. We're spending all this money on jars and rye and substrates and all this. Why don't we just grow the damn mushrooms? You know, so we did. And then we moved to, we moved out to Hawaii. I was going to go to graduate school in the fall, this would be 1976. By this time, we'd published the book, you know, and we'd done all that. And uh, I, I, we moved out there and rented a house on the big island. We were gonna try and grow them outside. And uh, it didn't work very well, And uh, but it didn't really matter. I, I played around with it for the summer and then I moved over to Honolulu and, you know, went into graduate school. I was still growing them in the little terrarium type styrofoam boxes. It was very peculiar because I had a pretty good set of mushrooms growing when I had to move. So I had to get these things on the airplane <laughs> and get them from the big island oh, to Honolulu. And wow. then I had to, I rented a car and raced around for the next few days trying to find a place to look to get the boxes set up so that they'd be ready to fruit. And, uh, yeah, so that's my criminal past. Nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. See so you, once you're the mushroom cultivator, moving, going on trips, vacations, those, that gets very complicated, very fast. It gets yes. complicated. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's great. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that so much. I mean, I don't even think, I mean, there was never any legal, I mean, we were paranoid as hell, of course, but nothing ever surfaced as far as yeah. I know. And now it's, now it's practically, I mean, in a lot of places like Colorado, it's, it's basically fine. It's yeah. legal the, as it the, should be. No, no, none of these things should ever be illegal. You know, we can have a yeah. conversation about the very idea that you could prohibit something like a plant like this. or a you fungus know, i mean i'm know. all for responsible use i'm not for prohibition yeah so well sort of in that vein um you know your your phd work uh you are an ethnopharmacologist you are very interested in the medicinal and pharmacological value of plants uh and and i guess a little bit of fungus so I'm interested in your perspective right now, right? This, you, you know, we're going from the Wasson days to now this like full fledged Mike Pollan, everybody writes the Renaissance money's coming in. It's not even legal yet, but money's just flooding in and mm -hmm. good and bad things are happening. Mm -hmm. I'm interested good and bad things. Right. always. Yes. I'm interested in your perspective. How do we honor uh, that gap between the traditional indigenous wisdom from, you know, l like these Amazonian tribes, uh, Mexican, uh, you know, culture, all these different places that still have, you know, held on to th this old use of this medicine or honestly any medicines and, and yet move it in, into the, the current you know, the current world, the commercialized, like the, what? This is a conundrum, you know, yeah. this is a conundrum. How do you respect and honor indigenous wisdom? How do you, the people that have been the stewards of these plants and fungi for millennia, yeah. you know, I mean, the, 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 the history of what's called biopiracy is not pretty you know and what we're seeing now is kind of a redo of the biopiracy that we've seen ever since the so-called Columbian exchange you know the interface the contact between the new world and the old world right. and the old people from the old world come over and steal all the food and medicinal plants you know most of the things that we eat 
are the result of biopiracy. They were taken out of their cultural context and integrated, co-opted and adapted by the Europeans and other people. And, uh, and this is just inevitable, you know, this, this is just the way it happens. And we're, we're seeing the same thing with the, with the psychedelic plants and the other medicinal plants as well. And, uh, you know, capitalism, people want to cash in, you know, on psychedelics. They want to cash in on mushrooms and to a certain extent, some of these other things. I think there's a moral obligation to make sure that the indigenous people have a place at the table, a big stake in this, some kind of right. payback. It should, I mean, the thing is, these plants, these fungi are supposed to raise people's consciousness and make us more ethical about our relation with these things, you know, and, and our obligations to the indigenous cultures, which have been the stewards of this knowledge, but always marginalized, you know, and I mean, it, the, 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 you know, the historical, uh, picture is not pretty where these European cultures primarily, but other cultures come into these cultures. They take the food and medicinal plants, uh, and they say, well, they don't even bother to say thank you. You know, at least they could thank the right. people, but they don't even do that. They bring them back. So all of these things like chocolate and, and uh, you know, many, many coffee. Well, coffee is European, but, but chocolate, coca, uh, quinine is another important mm -hmm. medicinal plant that came from, from uh, you know, traditional knowledge that was in, in the, during the age of exploration, this was the chief, uh medicine that was used for malaria you know right. and the indigenous people were quite generous with their knowledge and said you guys are having problem with malaria this is the remedy if they just kept their mouth shut it might have slowed down <laughs> you know the the neo-colonial uh, uh uh robbery of the medicinal plant pharmacopoeia of, of indigenous people but people are taking these substances, even the capitalists are taking them. And I would hope that these experiences might trigger a bit of a sort of moral awakening in some of these people that would say, well, wait a minute, we're maybe we do owe some something back right. to the indigenous people. And how do we make this right? How do we give them a seat at the table and acknowledge that you know, I mean, they, the indigenous people by and large, they do not have concepts of ownership. You know, they're not going to talk about patents and intellectual properties. I mean, they do now because, you know, they're smart people and they can, you know, they have people from their culture that are going to universities and going to law schools. Right. So, you know, they have their own lawyers and their own people like that can, that can represent this, but it's not really built into the culture. And of course, in the, in the uh, European culture, capitalism and ownership is very much part of the culture, but uh, people have a moral obligation to make sure that the indigenous people are not cut out of the deal, if you will. And, right. uh, and some companies are really trying to do this other companies not so much you know and you've got a whole spectrum of people that are working on this like you know a group that i like to talk about is uh icers you know okay. if you you know i mean they're trying to protect these plants and the over harvesting of these plants like ayahuasca iboga peyote these plants are endangered because yeah. people love them too much. You know, actually, I'd like to, at this point, I'd like to plug uh, the conference we did last year called ESPD 55. People can go to ESPD55.com. And uh, it's ESPD stands for Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. It's a conference that the McKenna Academy did last May, May 2022. 
and it's all open access and there's some really good stuff there. People can go to ESPD55.com and you can look at all the videos, all the presentations. The reason I bring it up in this context is to draw people's attention to one in particular, which was presented by uh, people from ICERS. Uh, and it addresses all of these questions, uh, at least raises all of these questions. I think it's called something like, uh, you know, what do you do when you love the plants so much that you're killing them or something like that. But people uh, can okay. search on that. And I urge people to take a look at it because it frames these issues very well. Nice. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, so it's a mixed bag, you know, I mean, I mean, capitalists are not entirely devoid of moral compasses, but Hopefully. many of them are for yeah. many of them, making money is the only thing. And it, it's rather dismaying that, uh, you know, people like Peter Thiel, you know, is a major investment in, in the psilocybin industry, you know, and you have to wonder, has he availed himself? of the experience it yeah. might open his mind it might change his attitudes but you know but probably not i mean i mean a curadero that i respect very much once told me he said there are two kinds of people i will not give ayahuasca to one is schizophrenics because yeah. it won't help them and it may hurt them the other one is sociopaths because they're blind to it. They don't listen to it. They will not learn the lessons. I'd say Peter Thiel probably falls into that category as well as many of these predatory capitalists. Yeah, so you know, there, my, there's a there's, there's a lot opinion. of sociopaths in the world. They, they're not rare. It's a type not of person. Not rare at all. Yeah. Not rare at all. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. We deal with that too. Uh, yeah. These days, you know, just there's a lot of good people in, in, in this online cube community that's all about growing new genetics crossing you know monocarions with other you know cultigens and and they're really in it for all the the peer cultivation science and progression of the cultivation practice and then there are people that go oh i can just take all your hard work and i can just go sell it I just get well, one yeah. culture from you. And this is the way, it. this is the way capitalism works, yeah. you know? Yeah, and exactly. I mean, the thing is, I am all for innovation, you know, I'm all for science and experimentation. And I think this is how we advance knowledge, but it has to come from a, from a moral, moral perspective. There is a morality. I mean, I, we can get off on this forever and, and I don't know if we want to, but you know, I make the point often in my talks, I say sometimes there's no such thing as a bad drug. Yeah. There are plenty of ways to misuse drugs, you know, to use drugs in bad ways. Yes. But the moral compass, the, the behavioral aspect comes from within our hearts. And I think this is true of any technology, you know, technology, whatever it might be, the internet, drugs, you know, even atomic energy, all of these things, they are morally neutral. They are simply what they are. You know, it's the uses we choose to make of them that is good or bad, beneficial or harmful. And people don't think about this, you know, in, in the in the dialogue that we've had in this culture for decades now about drugs, you know, the war on drugs, like drugs are treated as like viruses or pathogens or, yep. you know, the drugs are simply the drugs that do, that have the properties that they have. It's all about the moral element is how people employ them. You know, and a good example is opiates. I mean, we see enormous, incredible ways that opiates can be harmful, but equally, they're also beneficial you know, yeah. if employed properly. So, uh, so that's my moral soapbox about this. Be, be careful of technology 
think about the moral implications. And this is so true now with these emerging technologies, you know, genetic engineering, AI, psychopharmacology, uh, all of these types of things, you know, nanotechnology, they have enormous potential to uh, benefit our species. And they have an equally possible potential to completely wipe us out. Right. So we need wise people. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating? It's dismaying that people seem to be getting stupider rather than oh, wiser. Yes, it's <laughs> In true. the cultural meme space. Well, because why do, why do I have to, you know, first off, I don't even have to remember phone numbers anymore. Yeah, right. I, I, right. I don't have to remember anything. It's it's all in my phone. I don't have. It's all right? there. It, it's all there, right? So the kids these days, I hate to sound like an old man, but right, they they don't truly understand the value of acquiring knowledge, synthesi synthesizing information, hypothesizing. None of that. It's no. all there. All the information is already on the internet in their minds. Right. So it, and it's all about entertainment, not actually yes. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're beginning to sound like a couple of old reprobates, <laughs> which is what I guess we are. You know? Yes. I mean, yeah. I we, certainly Because we I... lived through before all this technology. What, what gets yeah. me is that, so I had this, uh, this woman, Rachel Harrison, she wrote a book about, uh, ayahuasca. She wrote a recently a book about these female guides. And, uh, she said, it's interesting because this new psychedelic Renaissance is being framed around its medicinal value and mm -hmm. its economic value, but not its spiritual value. And I think, right. uh, what you just brought up with just technology in general, right? We frame it around economy. We don't frame it around culture uh no. spirituality no. we don't say what is this phone gonna do to me as a human being as a caring human being is it gonna make me more caring how could it make me less caring? we, we don't all depends on how you use it exactly you know, but we it don't all depends yeah. on how you i mean set and setting who i mean the idea that this phone these things you know you carry in your hand not the sum total of human knowledge, but 90% of it is instantly accessible. Oh, it's crazy. That's got to be a good thing, I think. It's got to be a good thing. But the Eventually, is, what there's do you some hiccups. Do with that godlike power. Yes. yes you know, how I do you agree. deploy it? How do you use it in such a way that people are, are benefited and not harmed by it? I mean, social media is another good example. Another good reason for people to. Uh, buy my book because the the new part the 50 pages or so which is in the book is an after afterward that was that was uh, kind of look back looks back at the last 20 years and forward into the future a, a lot of it is about these questions you know oh, and, one of my i mean i loved it say, all well, but i you know, love it's that just this this old man raving you know, which is true. I'm an old man. I'm a raver. Uh, you know, and the older I get, probably the less relevant I get to the to the cultural experiment. I mean, I'll be gone fairly soon. I don't. You know, I'm going to leave the stage, like it or not, in a Someday. decade, couple decades, who yeah. knows? But you know, uh, but so I am concerned for the future. You know, at the same time, I'm incredibly optimistic for the future. I think, I think we monkeys are, <laughs> we're a funny species, you know, we're oh, incredibly yeah. stupid and incredibly smart and inventive and all that. So I think it's a 50-50 yeah. where, where we're going with this, you know, we have the, op but it requires clarity and uh, serious thinking about who we are and what is our place in nature and why are we so disjointed from nature we're the ones that have to ask this question because i think nature doesn't give a shit nature will survive no. we may not but nature will live maybe not in the form that it is now it may it will be profoundly transformed and probably profoundly wounded yeah, by, by what us. we are doing to it, but the planet plays out 
Gaia, if you will, if you like that metaphor. Mm -hmm. Gaia works on a time frame of hundreds of millions of years. We work on a time frame we can't even predict the next quarter. <laughs> you know, this is a problem. We yes. we totally lack the long term perspective. Gaia works on a very very long term perspective. So Gaia will be around. Life in some form on the planet will survive for probably billions of years. You know, until finally the sun goes nova or whatever. Right. But, you know, the life that survives post-human may not be so pretty. I mean, uh, intelligent cockroaches or something. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> Who knows? Now, I will say I, I loved the very end of this new edition quite a bit. I, I thought maybe it was a, a, a new section from, from the, the original printing of it. That was yeah. one of my favorite, maybe just because I am becoming that old man. But um, yeah, I just, I feel like one, the greatest gift of getting old is perspective. And so exactly. you just have more of it. You just, you do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so have, I appreciate it. Lived, lived longer, longer periods and you've seen a lot of change. And so yeah. may I be personal and ask you how old you are? 47. Yeah, I know. I'm a child, child, right? I'm just you're a child. child. Yes. yes. <laughs> Good for you. Yes. Good for you. You're 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 at a wonderful age where you're actually young enough to make a difference. And that's you know, the hope. You, you've got the energy and you've got the right perspective. I'm almost. Well, I'm, I'm roughly I'm I'm roughly twice as old as you are. I'll be 73 in December. And, you're still you know, young so i'm old and sure i feel that you know yeah but i'm still kicking and i'm still making yep. trouble and i'm still raving and yeah. whatever so uh, yeah. yeah i i was gonna say to you you know you i felt like you wrote the book like this was it on one level like you wanted to get it all out and i was like oh but Dennis, you're still doing lots of stuff. You still, you still got the academy. You're still, I mean, you are still, when I prepared for this at, at first, I was like, I'm going to be like the great student and I'm going to find the perfect quote from here and, and all this kind of stuff. And then I was like, he's just done so much. And it's been so focused around uh, uh, this love of nature, this interest in what can chemicals that we find in nature do for us and to us. And how can we use that in a greater context to improve the world? I mean, you're you're still doing it. You're here talking to me. Uh, people can go on yeah. YouTube. There's a million YouTube videos. You're, I mean, you're probably doing seven more of these tomorrow. I mean, you're still doing a lot of great things. But well, I understand doing, what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, I, 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 I'm doing them. I'm doing them because I enjoy them. I enjoy conversations like this. Right. Uh, and it's been great, by the way. I mean, I've been raving. I haven't given you a chance to ask many questions, but no, that's you great. Got me that's on a roll, you know. So. That's my favorite. My favorite yeah, scenario that's... is when I can ask one question and then thirty minutes later go, "I love it." I didn't have to. Yeah. Say. It's harder. Uh, it's it, it, it's harder to edit them too when when uh, when I I, when I, I have like to talk. I think we have to wrap it up, but I'd yeah. like to. A couple of I'd like to put some plugs in. What what is for the McKenna Academy? Just yep. just go to McKenna McKenna dot Academy or www dot McKenna dot Academy, and it's all there. And and once you get to that website, then check out ESPD, okay. which are the two conferences we did, one in twenty seventeen and one in uh, twenty twenty two. ESPD fifty and the ESPD. 55 both of those are <clears throat> excuse me both of those are uh just they're open access we ask you to register with your email there's no paywall there's some great stuff there I awesome mean, not my stuff other people presenting incredible incredible stuff and then most recently we've started a podcast series Ooh, my which favorite is called uh the brain forest cafe <laughs> okay. that's on it. the website and it'll be it's on several other sites we're we're trying to get it on apple podcast but you can go to the web 
<clears throat> you can go to the website and uh, right. and we're not dropping them. You know, we have about half a dozen up there. We're going to have more. We're dropping them about once a month, but we've got some great folks we're interviewing. Awesome. So, I so will link to... all those. Yeah, I'll have all the information in the description of the video so people can find it. And uh, I'm kind of excited about the ESPD 55 stuff. Um, I might reach back out if something really speaks to me and I want to talk about it some more. I'll, you know, get your permission or whoever I got sure. talked to, to to make sure, sure. that's okay. Um, yeah. That's great. I also want to say just this morning on your Instagram, I saw this um, Descending the Mountain. Anne's got a, a, a documentary oh, yeah. coming oh. out. Okay. I thought that was great. Um, um, I just think that it's such a wonder, you know, what I might be a little pessimistic in going and being critical about the term Renaissance, but in so many ways, I tr do truly feel like I like your, your, the age of psychedelics. I like that feels yeah. really yeah. final yeah. and concrete and not fleeting to me. So, um, yeah. I, maybe we great. should call it the psychozoic. How's Ooh, that? All right. Name? Yeah. Yes. Maybe it's the psychozoic. That is cool. I like yeah. that. That's that's yeah. just geeky enough for me. I, I like that. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thanks well thank so you. Yes. I, I mean, I, I such an honor. I, I really appreciate it. To me, it just such such a testament of your character, uh, a, just life's work that will just keep going forever. Well, thank, thank you. you. I hope so. As, as long as there's a YouTube, there'll be something up there. You know, it's, that's so, our immortality now so yes <laughs> let let me know when you've uh, dropped the podcast and we'll get it on our social media will do and i have to i have to go because i'm losing my voice here so uh, it's awesome it's been a real pleasure talking I'll, to you thank you so much yep yeah i'll let you know when it airs okay all, all right, the thank, best thank you dennis uh, yeah bye-bye bye. All right, guys, that was Dennis McKenna, the one and only. Man, that was cool. That was so fun. Uh, I mean, just taking myself back, imagining him and Terrence doing all those cool things and then just to just keep going and to take it seriously. You know, I talk a lot on the show about grow mushrooms and then do one more thing, do one more thing to contribute to this community. And my God, I mean, <laughs> he's, he's, he's the shining star example of what, what, what that could be. So again, I, every week I'm going to keep saying it, you know, let's keep exploring this medicine for ourselves, for our healing, um, uh, for the spiritual, uh, promise and, and possibility of, of what could be. Um, to expand our consciousness for all those reasons, but let's also not lose sight of the fact that we are part of this community, uh, given the dynamics, the political, legal dynamics of what we do, right? We are a tight-knit community. We are close. Um, let's take care of one another. Let's, let's contribute to this community. If you are somebody out there and you, all you see in this community is people to take advantage of, let's get out. None of us want you here. I mean, hell, look what we did to Max Yieldbins a couple weeks ago, right? Like, homie, don't play that. There's, there's zero tolerance policy. If you come in here to take advantage of us, you will, you, we, we will destroy you. We will kick you out of this community. So again, watch out, sneaky MFers. We don't want you here. Everybody else, everybody that's here for the right reasons, we're so glad you're here. Um, I can't wait to meet more of you every day. I get to know more of you guys. Um, so let's just have that attitude, right? Like we're all doing our best. We're all trying to make it through life. It's very difficult, but we can do one more thing. Uh, anyway, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox again. Dennis McKenna, the one and only, it was amazing. Can't wait to talk to him again. Um, next week, fungi florist. We're going to sit down and find out how he gets uh, those reishi to do all the crazy stuff he gets them to do. Um, hear his whole story. Uh, learn a little growing tech about growing reishi as well. Um, and then we're going to do a check-in with uh, Ray on her trip to uh, the southernmost point of Texas, which is probably also the southernmost point of the United States. I don't know. I didn't look that up before I recorded this. Anyway, again, shout out. 
Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab, Kyle Kanan. Um, he's he's going to be the one sequencing a lot of the Myco Blitz samples. So uh, good on you, brother. Uh, really appreciate all you're doing for the community. Speaking of doing one more thing. Um, and then don't forget, we got the uh, Mutant uh, Madness Girl Along coming up. Uh, probably the end of this month, beginning of December. Um if you guys are in my Discord, uh, I got a poll going on, just trying to get a gauge of how many people are going to be doing it. Um, we just want to know how much LC to make for all you guys, or how many plates to to, to prep. Anyway, so uh, next week, see you guys then. Uh, in the meantime, keep growing mushrooms. Mm -hmm.